On behalf of the organizers, uh, welcome everybody to Return of the Intertwined, New Developments in Correlated Materials. Uh, this is an online reunion conference following up on the uh, uh, workshop we had at KIPP in 2017. Uh, we are going to have sessions this morning and tomorrow morning. Uh, the talks will be half an hour, roughly, with 10 or 15 minutes of discussion to follow. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. During the talk, uh, please restrict those to short questions of clarification. There'll be time for uh, more substantive questions uh, after the talk. So uh, our first speaker is Subir Sachdev from Harvard. He'll be talking about intertwining fractionalization and broken symmetry theories for the onset of magnetism in disordered and clean metals. All right, you're on. All right, uh, thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. So um, I'll be talking about uh, some work we've done in the past year. Uh, looking at the interplay between uh, fractionalization uh, and broken symmetries, and I'll focus on the most interesting case of uh, magnetism. In the case of disordered systems, it will be spin glass order. And if I have uh, time towards the end, I'll also discuss uh, the clean case with ordinary antiferromagnetism, uh, which turns out to be far more complicated uh, and not as well understood. Okay, so I should mention uh, a number of collaborators before I begin. Um, I probably certainly won't be able to discuss all their respective contributions, just to try to give you an overview. Uh, there's uh, Dashan Joshi, a postdoc at Harvard, uh, Grisha Tanapolsky, also a postdoc at Harvard, Henry Shackleton, who's a graduate student at Harvard, uh, Chen Yuan Li is also a graduate student. Uh, and Alex Vitek and Antoine George uh, from the Flatiron Institute. Uh, I'll also talk about some related work very briefly by Ha Yu Guo, a student at Harvard, and Ying Fei Gu, postdoc, uh, soon to go to Caltech. Uh, and finally, at this time on the clean case, uh, I'll talk about some interesting new ideas by uh, Yahui Zhang, who's a postdoc at Harvard. Okay, so here's my outline. Uh, I'm going to actually spend most of my time on talking about a very specific model. Uh, it's an artificial model, but uh, I think it has the advantage of being uh, something that has a lot of non-trivial physics. And also it seems that we can make uh, analytic and numerical progress. So one hopes that many of these strong coupling problems that we've been uh, obsessing over for the, uh, for the past decade can at least in the context of this simple model, we can uh, reach some uh, resolution. So I'll define the model and begin by presenting some uh, numerical results. So let me just uh, continue then. So here's the model. Uh, so it's got uh, every side, they can be spin up or a spin down electron. Uh, they can be doubly occupied or empty. The first term is just a hopping between any pair of sites. Uh, if this was the only uh, term in the Hamiltonian, this would be a random matrix uh, with a semicircular density of states. So we're gonna have some density of the electrons. And so then this term by itself would give you a disordered metal. Uh, there's no localization because TIJ uh, is, connects any pair of sites with a random number. Uh, so it's just a metallic state, which is disordered. Uh, Quasi-particles are certainly well-defined. Then there's, uh, I'm seeing this panelist, okay. Uh, then there's the, uh, the Hubbard repulsion, use of H for Hubbard, to emphasize that, uh, which acts on every site. Uh, and this is non-random, this is positive and non-random. So if I, if, I, if I had only these two terms, the first and the last term, this would be the well-known Hubbard model with random hopping. Uh, but to get an interesting physics, uh, we need to put in explicitly uh, an exchange interaction. And this will also be random, so these exchange couplings J i j are completely random. 
Now you might say, why do I need the JIJ? Uh, doesn't the Hubble term by, by on its own uh, generate an exchange interaction? Well, it does, but in this uh, infinite range limit, you notice the hopping is about a one over square root of n. Uh, the generated exchange will be about a t squared, it will be about a one over n. So it's actually negligible. So to get any significant exchange and its important consequences, we do have to put this term by hand. Uh, we're going to take JIJ to be have zero mean, uh, otherwise random, but uh, it's not that hard to also put in a uh, uh, non-zero mean, but it makes the problem a bit more complicated. So I'm not going to do that. All right, so uh, the task we set ourselves, uh, well, actually following some work at Flatiron uh, and also with Una Kim's group, uh, was to understand something about this model uh, as a function of uh, two parameters. Uh, the, this is the inverse of the Hubbard repulsion on the vertical axis and the doping P on the horizontal axis. So let's just begin by just talking about P equals zero. At, so the ins uh, at, with uh, exactly half filling. Well, when the Hubbard repulsion is very weak, which is up here, uh, then the electrons hop around and barely see each other. So what you expect uh, at large, uh, at small u, is just a disordered Fermi liquid. And in this random system, we, we're going to characterize the Fermi liquid uh, not by any Fermi surface, because there isn't any Fermi surface, but, for example, by the spin-spin correlation function, the local spin-spin correlation function. So that decays is 1 over tau squared, and this is simply a consequence of having a constant density of states at the Fermi level. Uh, so because of the constant density of states, the one electron propagated decays 1 over tau, uh, and the spin correlation function is just the square of that, because it involves two uh, electron hole pair, uh, and that gives you the 1 over tau squared. So this 1 over tau squared with the characteristic signature of a, of a disordered Fermi liquid. Okay, so now as you increase u, what you do expect at some point is to have a Mott Hubbard transition to some insulator. Uh, and I'll present, I'll show you some recent beautiful numerical results uh, on the nature of this transition. Uh, if I keep going to even larger u, uh, then you know, neither of these terms start to matter. And I just have a random exchange interaction between any pair of spins. So this is, you know, the analog of what's called the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model, but now for quantum spin a half, not Ising spins as in the original Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. And we're interested in what this does at zero temperature. Do, do quantum fluctuations give you some interesting uh, quantum liquid state of the spins? Uh, it turns out they don't. Uh, and this was studied numerically by Arachi and Rosenberg uh, some time back. Uh, and they showed that the ground state of this was pretty much very similar to the classical model. Uh, it's an insulator with spin glass order. Uh, and this means that the local spin-spin correlation function at long time goes to a constant. So there's memory of the spin orientation uh, for infinite time uh, in contrast to the one over tau squared decay uh, in the Fermi liquid. Okay. So now I want to turn to uh, this very nice work just came out in uh, PNAS by Peter Chai et al. And Cornell and Flatiron. Studied this, uh, this model numerically. So the way you do this is you take the large end limit and write it in terms of some very complicated set of uh, integral differential equation and an associate quantum impurity problem. You put that on the computer and see what comes out. So they found, in particular, that there was a continuous metal insulated transition where the charge gap vanished. And right at this critical point, uh, they found that the spin correlation function decayed uh, in a manner that was intermediate between 1 over tau squared and constant. Uh, it was 1 over tau. Uh, and this was, you know, got me, very, you know, got them and me also quite excited because this is precisely the spin uh, decay in the SYK model. I, I'm not going to review that here. I'm going to give you actually a better way of understanding this and more general way of understanding where this comes from. Also, it seemed from their results, although this is not fully confirmed, uh, that the spin glass order survived all the way up to uh, the Mott Hubbard transition, uh, but not in the, in the metallic state. So here's some of their numerical data. This is, uh, I won't go into the details of describing this. This is 
uh, plot of the spin correlation function at different temperatures right at the critical point. And from, and it fits very beautifully to the finite temperature realization uh, of this one over tau decay. Also right at the critical point, they measure the resistivity. Now exactly how you define the resistivity for an infant rate model is a, is a little tricky. Uh, you really have to consider a slightly different model with uh, in large dimension, not a model on a fully connected cluster. Uh, so I won't go into that, but anyway, it, it, there's a well clear way to defining what the resistivity is. And they found that the resistivity uh, is linear in temperature down to the lowest temperature they looked at. You know, this is now 0.01 of the hopping, uh, so, uh, or the bandwidth. So it's really, uh, I think numerically, this is probably some sort of a record uh, of a numerical observation of linear resistivity uh, in terms of how low in temperature uh, it holds. Uh, this holds only right at the critical point. If you move away eventually on the disordered side, uh, uh, disordered Fermi liquid side becomes a T square. So, so this particular transition, you know, seems to intertwine in the theme of this conference two different things happening at the same point. Uh, one is that the, uh, there's a metal insulator transition. The charge gap opens up on this side, and here the charge excitation are gapless. And the second, is the onset of spin glass order. Uh, although again, not fully settled, but it's a reasonable hypothesis that uh, both of them happen at the same point or they intertwine. Uh, and so this uh, very nice work opens up, you know, lots of interesting questions of, you know, you know, what's going on? Is there a theoretical understanding behind this? So I'm going to present some of our ideas. Uh, we, I don't think we fully understand this particular model uh, but there are other models uh, related, which turn out to be a little simpler, where we think we have some made some progress. Uh, and in particular, one theme that will emerge uh, is that right at the critical point, where you have two different things happening, uh, you really need, need to understand it in terms of fractionalization of the electron. In particular, this strange one over tau decay becomes quite easy to understand once you introduce fractionalization uh, right at the critical point. But note that both phases, uh, both the spin glass phase and the disordered metal are conventional phases. All right, so now let me continue with this phase diagram because the theme of my talk will actually not be at P equals zero, but will be at finite P. Let's dope the system and then ask what happens. So first of all, we expect that when at large doping again, uh, the Hubbard repulsion won't make much of a difference. And so you expect a disordered Fermi liquid also at sufficiently large doping. So what happens in between? Well, the simplest hypothesis, which as far as we can tell is correct, although not fully established, uh, is that uh, there's just a, a spin glass phase that extends out from the insulating spin glass uh, where uh, the, now the system is however metallic. And then there must be a phase transition uh, from the metallic state of the spin glass to the, uh, to the disordered Fermi liquid. So this phase is also a Fermi liquid uh, in the sense there's a component of the spin correlation function that decays the one over tau squared, but there's also a, a term that goes to a constant from the frozen spins. Uh, and one of the things we can argue is that this phase transition, even at finite doping, uh, has a strange character. It has some intertwining. Uh, because the, precisely the point where the spin glass order disappears is also the point where the carrier density, uh, to the extent you can define that in a fully disordered system, has a jump, uh, and a jump from P to 1 plus P. So that's what I'm going to argue in the most of my talk. All right. Uh, okay, so now let me also show you some other unpublished and very preliminary numerical results. Uh, trying to look at very large U. So, we, so at very large U and as a function of doping, uh, you can send UH to infinity and then this model reduces uh, to the TJ model. And this will be the focus of the rest of my discussion. Uh, so this is a, a model with again, the same TIJ that's random and JIJ that's random, uh, but there's a, a double occupancy constraint. The number of fermions or electrons on each side has to be less than or equal to one. Uh, so there are three states on each side, empty, up, and down, and, and these are random numbers. So 
you know, it's a very well defined problem and we'd love to know the solution of this problem uh, as a function of P and maybe even T over J. Uh, but it's still too hard. We still don't even numerically, this is uh, very hard to uh, do because of various sign problem issues. So what I'm going to show you are some recent results by Henry Shackleton, unpublished and very preliminary, uh, on exact diagonalization. So you take, take a cluster of n sites, and I think n is about 12 to 14, something like that. Uh, and then what you measure is the local dynamic spin susceptibility. So this is the Fourier transform uh, of the spin spin correlation function in real frequency omega. So here's the result actually at, in the insulator. This was a result open, uh, obtained earlier by Aritya and Rosenberg, and we confirmed their result. And this is the full dynamic spin susceptibility. And what you see is it has a Gaussian background, which turns out to be independent of system size. So it's some local spin fluctuations, uh, which are not terribly interesting to us. What's interesting to us is this little bump at low frequency. And this bump has become sharper and sharper the larger your system size. Again, not shown because this is relatively preliminary. And the fact that there's a bump, the bump is shown here where you subtract out the background, uh, to, that's a measure. The weight under this bump is a measure of the spin glass, Edgar's Anderson spin glass order parameter. So that's a zero doping. And now you can see as you increase the doping, the bump remains for a while, uh, becomes weaker. And by around P equals one third, uh, it disappears. And now uh, there's a P also have, uh, Henry has data also at higher doping. Anyway, so from this preliminary work, we can kind of estimate at least at very large U, uh, there's some transition of the disappearance of spin glass order at around one third doping. As we'll see, it turns out to be analytically a very simple way of understanding uh, this one third. Okay, so let me uh, also quickly mention, I can't resist mentioning this very nice paper by Marc-Henri Julien, uh, just out in Nature Physics. Uh, where they looked at freezing of spins by nuclear magnetic resonance uh, and in high magnetic field, uh, when they suppress the superconductivity, they do see in LSCO uh, a region of uh, spin glass or some glassy spin behavior all the way out to, uh, you know, the P star, of which in, in this material is around 0.18. Okay, uh, so that's... Uh, so that's a description of the model and of some numerical results. Uh, maybe I'll pause here for questions. On, and and the rest, the, most of my rest of my talk will be now some theory to try to understand the numerics that uh, I have just presented. So, Steve, are there any questions? Uh, there was a little bit of exchange of questions in chat. Uh, nobody's raised their hand. Uh, All right. So why don't you go okay. on? Okay. All right. So then I'll go on to part two. Uh, where I'm going to tell you about. Uh, oh, wait, there's a, there's a hand raised. Just a sec, let's. Yes, please. Okay, uh, so um, uh, Rudro Biswas. Oh. Hi, Subir. Um, a quick question. What is the evidence that the insulating phase of the spin glass does not extend to finite doping, given that the couplings are disordered? Uh, well, okay, I don't have any numerical evidence to show you, but that seems highly unlikely uh, that at finite doping you're going to get uh, insulator. This, the TIJ are infinite range, so there's no Anderson localization possible. There's I no see. sense of space here. They're infinite range. Okay, thank you. And we have a uh, question from Eduardo Fratkin. Eduardo? Eduardo? Need to unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. The question is, uh, I think he briefly addressed that uh, recently in the numerical part. But how is the spin glass order being characterized as the replica symmetry breaking, as a non-vanishing edward Sanderson order parameter, which would be equivalent in some ways? Yeah. Uh, so uh, okay, we have. Uh, uh, yeah, so we we have various papers on this, but yeah, we do expect replica symmetry breaking there. But the numerics is just, you know, we've just looked at the local spin-spin correlation function. We haven't looked at, uh, you know, 
the distribution. We're just averaging over many samples right now. Okay. It's, we do expect replica symmetry breaking in the spin glass phase in this infinite plane model. Yes. But it's not important for anything that I'm going to talk about, especially at the critical point. We don't have to worry about these issues. It only becomes an issue within the phase. And then it's, the issues are very similar to that of the SK model. They're not any different. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Leo Redsofsky. Uh, Leo, so I'm going to have to take some time out of the discussion at the end. Yes. <laughs> just, a, just a quick question, Subir. I wanted to understand whether the numerics is done on the short range model or it's done on the infinite range model. The infinite range model. Infinite range model. Exactly the model. Exactly the model I show you. That's oh, all. I see. Just exact so translation. And is the spin class phase supposed to survive beyond, you know, for for, for finite, realistic finite range model? <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, I would say why not. Yes, at zero temperature anyway. I don't okay. see any reason why I shouldn't. I mean, the replica symmetry breaking won't, but let's not get into that. Okay. <laughs> okay, sure. Thank you. Okay, good. Why don't you go on? All right. So, so let's talk about the original uh, model where I started looking at this a long time ago with Jin Wu Ye. Let me call that just the J model, the insulator. Uh, with SI dot SJ. Uh, so this model by itself uh, has spin glass order, as I showed you by Arachi and Rosenberg. Uh, but let's not uh, uh, stop us, that, that stop us. Let's look for other possible uh, interesting states that might appear in this class of models, which, are, which, are, which don't have spin glass order. Uh, all right, so these are just, okay, you can represent the spins in terms of these uh, Schwinger fermions, if you wish. But you can also write them in terms of Schwinger bosons, uh, and really that shouldn't make any difference to the nature of the ground state. So one thing you can do in the infinite range model of this uh, is you can average over JIJ and take the large end limit. And it turns out that you can then rewrite that problem, now again ignoring replica indices uh, for simplicity, uh, as, a, as a quantum impurity problem. So it's just a, a single spin that's fluctuating in time now, as that spin fluctuates in time, it picks up a very phase term, which is just the area uh, the trajectory uh, uh, encloses on the surface of a unit sphere. Uh, this is spin a half. That's the one half there. Uh, and more fancy, uh, people call this the Wesemino Witten term for a single spin. Okay. Uh, and then uh, there's a self interaction, retarded self interaction of the spin with itself with some interaction Q. So what is that interaction Q? Uh, well, it should be determined by a self-consistency condition that if in this partition function, you compute the spin-spin correlation function in time, uh, then this Q bar should equal Q. So you pick the Q, compute Q bar, and keep iterating until they become equal. So that gives you the solution of a quantum problem of some spin state here uh, that if it preserves spin rotation invariance, in fact, you can argue it has to be gapless. Uh, if you break spin rotation when you get a spin glass phase, and then you have to redo everything. So let's just ask, is there some kind of gapless uh, critical solution of this kind of problem? Uh, and this should be asked uh, in three. Uh, we solved it for the case of SUM spins rather than SQN spins, but I won't do that here. Uh, I'm going to actually use Another method we discovered later, uh, which holds exactly for SU2 spins. So we make a trial on sets that we say this Q of tau that appears in the action decays with some power law with exponent alpha. Uh, so now it's a well-posed question, given this decay uh, with some coupling gamma as one over tau to the alpha, uh, how does Q bar, what is Q bar? Can you compute it? Okay, uh, so this is a well-posed question that we can uh, approach using RG methods. Uh, and it turns out that the only thing that's present in the problem is a wave function denormalization of a field conjugate to the spin operator. Uh, this quantized very phase can't renormalize, and that gives you an essential simplicity to the problem. So what you find uh, is that you, uh, that you can do an expansion in powers of gamma and you can compute the beta function well be computed to two or, or you know to, to two loops or something, but they're terms to all orders. It is very complicated. 
uh, and but it, bec it, it becomes under control when alpha is close to two. So if now you can define an epsilon, which is two minus alpha, and you can compute anything you want uh, order by order in, uh, uh, in epsilon. So when you do this, you find that Q bar, the spin correlation function in this problem with the interaction Q, uh, decays as one over two minus alpha. And this is something you can actually show to all orders in epsilon, uh, and it's intimately linked, linked to this, uh, this very phase term being quantized. Because of that, uh, the only wave function is even though you can't determine the fixed point exactly, you can get the exponent exactly. It's kind of a cute trick, and uh, you can read these papers if you want to learn how that works. All right, so now I haven't computed Q bar exactly. I've at least got its power law. So at the very least, if I want to solve the equation Q equals Q bar, uh, 2 minus alpha must equal alpha. Uh, and that is precisely this 1 over tau decay uh, that is self-consistent. Now, this doesn't prove that for SU2, this solution exists for this model uh, because we haven't matched the coefficients. And numerically, when you do that, it turns out doesn't seem to work. Uh, but maybe some other model, uh, and in particular, <laughs> the model of Chai et al., uh, could be the place where this works. So S of tau, S of zero goes to one over tau. Uh, since then, the same decay has appeared in many other models, and in, including the SYK model. Anyway, but this is an exact exponent, which doesn't uh, really is an exact solution uh, of this particular problem that I defined on this slide. Okay, so now let's dope this thing and see what happens. Uh, so we take the TJ model now. Uh, and now the, the only difference really for the TJ model is that instead of having two states per site, we have three states. It turns out to be very convenient to think of this as some kind of super spin with three states. One of them, you know, has the opposite statistics from the other. If you make these two fermionic, you have to make this a, bo uh, a bosonic. So there's a boson, the holon and the fermion F in this case. Uh, and, and the super spin, uh, it lives in this super space, which is SU1 bar 2. One means the first, there's one direction that's bosonic, that's this one or these two directions are fermionic, that's the two. Uh, and really, you can just proceed in exactly the same way as for the pure J model, just replace spins by super spins and two states by three states. But there's another cute thing here. Of course, we know from all the work in fractionalization that you can take the opposite choice. Uh, you can make the whole of fermion uh, and the spins of boson. Uh, no problem, and then the, the space becomes SU2 bar 1, and these two spaces are actually exactly the same, uh, as you can look up in various math books. So uh, for this particular spin representation, there is no difference between the two, uh, and anything you work out for these two models, it should be the same. Okay, so now you go ahead and do exactly that. You take uh, average over TIJ, average over JIJ, take the larger limit, and it becomes a problem very much like the problem I showed you earlier, except one thing, you just replace spin by super spin. So the super spin is now P, uh, which lives in this uh, uh, space of uh, SU1 bar 2 or SU2 bar 1. This is the West Zemino term written in some abstract notation. And there's some self-interaction, uh, curly Q, uh, which has to be determined self-consistently. Uh, and the, but another important thing is this, this term. So this is linear in P, and you can think of this like a Zeeman field. So in the, in the ordinary spin system, a Zeeman field will make the energy of upspin different from downspin. Here, the S naught will make the energy of the whole on state different from the, uh, from the spin on state. There's no reason for them to be different. So there is this additional coupling. Okay, this is a rather formal way to write it. Uh, you could also write it uh, using either the state boson, the string of fermion method, with, and then you have to introduce a Lagrange multiplier, uh, and the very phase term is this complicated thing with the integral over lambda, and and the curly Q is really made up of two functions R and Q, uh, which are basically the electron Green's function and the spin-spin correlation function. 
Severe, so you're nominally okay. at half an hour. You you do deserve some more time, but I just wanted to <laughs> alert you. All right, thank you. I certainly won't be able to talk about the clean system, but let I'm pretty close to the end of this part. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right. So you do an RG analysis, very much like the ones I outlined for the J model, except you replace spins by super spins. And then, as I said, this is the crucial difference. Now you don't go to a gapless, uh, uh, non-trivial critical state uh, at any coupling because there's a Zeeman field S naught, and this S naught is a relevant perturbation. So you have to tune S naught to a special value uh, to reach the critical point. And once you tune S naught, then all the other couplings uh, flow to that fixed point. And this is what's shown in this paper. Uh, in particular, when S naught equals zero, as I said, the three states are degenerate. When S naught is positive. Uh, then, then the then the whole on state's lower in energy. Now, as you can expect, if this is lower in energy, the density of holes will increase, and so this is for larger p. This is some critical p, and this is for uh, smaller p, where the spin-ons are lower in energy. Uh, and furthermore, you can compute the spin-spin correlation function, and exactly like you found the J model. Again, you find to all orders. Uh, this one over tau decay in both the spins and the electrons. And now this shows you that there's something funny going on here. How can you have both the electrons decay as one over tau and the spins decay as one over tau? Because naively you would think of the spin-spin correlation function is the square of the electron correlation function, which is what happens in a Fermi liquid. But it's, that's not the way it happens. And so the, how do you understand this? Well, the way you can understand this crudely, at least in a large M limit, is in terms of fractionalization. You fractionalize the electron into a hole-on and a spin-on, and you write the electron as a product of a hole-on and a spin-on. So the electron operator becomes like a super spin operator. And you also write the spin in terms of product of two, two spin-ons. And if the hole-on and the spin-on decays one over square root of tau, then you immediately get both these correlators decaying one over tau. So this is just a signal of fractionalization. All right, so now the phase diagram I can draw this way. There's a critical point PC where the three states are degenerate, where both correlations decay as one over tau. And this is actually quite consistent with the numerical study of Chao et al. Uh, at half filling at the Mott Hubbard transition. Uh, and then what is the density? Well, uh, you can just see that one third of the states have a hole, so the density is one third, and that's remarkably close to what I showed you in the numerical data. So this is the world's simplest uh, reason for why uh, optimal doping is around one third. These three states are degenerate. Uh, then what happens uh, on either side? That's on one side, the whole on state is lower, and the other side, uh, the spin-on states are lower. Now, remember I told you you, could, you had a choice in making spin-ons and whole-ons, fermions or bosons. So here, the, all, all the RG tells you is that you flow off to infinity. Uh, either this way or that way. So if you flow off this way, this states become much lower than that. And if you want to take advantage of this, you want to make the low energy state a boson. So on this side, you will take, uh, you will make the state a boson and you'll condense it. Uh, and then when you condense this, then uh, you get these fermions which become effective like electrons. Uh, and, and you can just see this is an ordinary disordered Fermi liquid the carrier density of fermions, which is one minus p, but if you convert back to holes, it's one plus p. Conversely, on this side, you want to do the opposite thing. You want to make these low energy states bosons, and you condense them. Now, when you condense them, because these bosons carry spin, you're going to get spin glass order. This will decay to a constant, go to a constant. And these will be the uh, hole ons here, which are fermions, which are just the density of holes. So you also have a jump in the density from P to one plus P uh, going via fractionalization uh, at this critical point. So that's really essentially the punchline then. Uh, this whole line here, uh, at least down here, we argue uh, this is one over tau decay. Now, of course, the uh, Chai et al measured the one over tau at this point. Uh, we also have a theory of that, that point, which I haven't discussed. It's uh, not as well under control, but okay, uh, there's at least one version of it that gives you a one over tau decay. 
Um, I think I'm going to, yeah, okay. Okay, so let me just quickly mention this work. Uh, we can also compute the resistivity in this model. Uh, and it turns out, we argue that there, there are certain conditions under which under the resistivity is dominated by, in fact, corrections to scaling, because the leading term just gives you residual resistivity, the one over tau decay, except the Fermi liquid-like decay. But the leading term goes linearly in T, and this comes from this time reparameterization soft mode, uh, and that gives you a, at least a leading correction at low temperature, which is linear in temperature. All right, I think I will just, stop. I don't have time to talk about the non-random case. Uh, I will refer you um, to these papers here. And let me just show this here, if somebody wants to ask a question, uh, where the main idea is you take a physical electrons and you couple them to a whole bunch of insular qubits, uh, and that gives you a transition uh, but directly between the antiferromagnet metal and the Fermi liquid with uh, an interesting, very complicated uh, gauge theory for the critical point. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Uh, can I unmute people in order for them to applaud? Uh, I don't know how to do it. Um, but uh, let's see. No, I don't know how to do it. So why don't you show, let's all applaud anyway we can. Uh, <laughs> Subir, I wanna use my prerogative as session chair to ask a question just to make sure I've got the point. So looking at the, uh, the line with zero doping, uh, the surprising yeah. thing here is that the spin glass order and the insulating transition coincide. You might have naively thought that, for instance, the spin glass order could have persisted into the metal past the critical point, since it's perfectly possible, if you, as you've said, to have a metallic spin glass. And so the yeah, so special I, I, thing here is that there, the, that has to do with the fractionalization is that they're occurring at the same point. Is that right? That's the claim. I mean, I, I should say that you know, the evidence for it is not conclusive. Uh, there is evidence that's what's happening. Uh -huh. uh, and and the kind of RG arguments I've presented also support that picture. So if you start out with a description in terms of fractionalized degrees of freedom and you find this fixed point where you have this strong coupling flow from a fractionalized fixed point into two different directions, one of which requires you to condense the bosons and the other doesn't uh, carrying spin. Uh, that seems like a very natural interpretation of it. So I think, you know, we'd love to have more, I mean, there is some data on this in Chai et al. Uh, maybe Una cares to comment further on this question. Uh, if, I, and I, now, at the same time, you might say, you know, what about this transition? This is just an ordinary transition. There's only one order parameter, so what's the big deal? Uh, well, you can do a theory, a Landau theory of the onset of spin glass order in the metal, both sides of metals. Yeah. Uh, and we did that a while ago, and you do that, you get a very different exponent. You get tau to the three halves, in fact. Uh, and here I also gave you this argument that there's a measure yeah. of carrier density, which appears to jump across yeah. this transition. So here it's more subtle. There isn't obviously two different order parameters or two different characters. Uh, at least in the not in the random system, uh, but there is this one over tau. Uh, the, now, if you go to finite dimensions, then you know there's all these topological orders you can talk about, which you don't have here. <laughs> Good, but then it uh, becomes much more complicated. <laughs> let's see. We have uh, time for a few more questions. Uh, uh, okay, uh, Lu Jin Zhou. You're unmute yourself. Hi, thanks. Uh, Subia, can you go to the phase diagram which you have the SU12 and SU21 species? Yeah, this one. I guess I want to make sure I understand uh, why did you say in one side you need to choose, uh, yeah, in both sides, why did you say you need to choose the lower energy states? in the boson? Uh, this is just very naive. I mean, if you have a low energy state, uh, if you have, if there's things are boson, you can put more of them in that state. 
and gain that energy. Uh, so generally, you know, if you have a choice between occupying some low energy state, you should occupy with a boson rather than a fermion. Yeah, that's all. But uh, suppose now I start from the positive P side, where the bosons yeah. are condensed, then when I approach PC, am I uh, making the boson less and less condensed and eventually ungapped across PC? Correct. So, so, so right, right at PC, uh, you can write down a critical theory. And in fact, we have that in our paper. We can write that critical theory either in terms of these bosons, the SU123, or the SU213. We get exactly the same answers. So here we, there is a duality, sub-duality at this point. Or you can use either representation uh, because, uh, and you get the same answers. At least in this epsilon I, expansion. Yeah, I guess my confusion is and immediately across PC, now B, uh, starting from the positive side, now B acquires a gap. Uh, how do I see that phase becomes a metallic spin glass? Well, that's not the right description of that phase. I mean, so first of all, you know, this the Bs and Fs really, uh, they, they're not gauge invariant objects to begin with. Huh? <laughs> so uh, we can only take kind of approximate crutches for us to talk about things. Uh, there are tools you can use to compute the RG equations here, but in the end, uh, it doesn't matter which one you use. So another way to say this is that there is something like a gauge field here, which is the constraint or the very phase term, and we do the integral over the gauge field exactly. So any gauge fields that are present, we integrate over them exactly. That's really what allows us to proceed in this way. It, it's, of course, that's much harder, um, impossible in finite dimensions. But in zero dimensions that are in these infinite range models, you can actually do it. Um, so, yeah, so. It, oh, so I, I mean, what I would say on this side, you know, the I guess in finite dimensions, you would say, you know, there's, uh, if you think in terms of Z2 spin liquid, where there are, there are bosons and fermions, well, it all depends which one has lower in energy. On this side, it's the, it's the bosonic uh, uh, holons, and here it's the fermionic, or the other way around. Here it's the fermionic holons, and here it's the bosonic holons. <laughs> Going back to a very old debate in ITC a long time ago <laughs> that Steve was part of. Uh -huh. um, so, you, so you mean uh, it's difficult to just uh, stick with one description and, dis and describe the entire phase diagram. The advantage here is to right. utilize, utilize the formulation you just presented. Yeah, so the, another way to say this is that, of course, if you solve the theory exactly, you can use any description you want. But if you mm -hmm. want to use a simple ansatz, a mean field ansatz, then the mean field ansatz of, of a bosonic, a fermionic holons is better on the right. No, sorry, bosonic holons is better on the right. And a mean field ansatz of fermionic holons is better on the left. That's the claim. Okay. So we're we're actually out of time, but we have two more questions. If you could both keep your questions very short, uh, let's uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Rudro Biswas, you you can unmute yourself. Um, hi, Subi. <clears throat> Another quick question: The PNAS uh, resistivity data seems to show a zero intercept at uh, zero temperature. Um, it, should I take that seriously? And what does it mean? Um, uh, in your theory, which um, had some generic value of the resistivity at zero temperature. You're, you're absolutely right. So we don't understand that the intercept is so small, at least I don't, and I've talked to Anton about it. Maybe okay, Una has something to say. Uh, in our theory, which is done in the large M limit, so that particular theory here, which I very quickly went over, required us to work in the large M limit. And in the large M limit, the intercept, in fact, this prefactor is quite a bit larger than this. Uh, but my best, our best guess right now, that's an artifact of the large M limit. And for SU2, uh, the residual resistivity is much smaller. But that's a very interesting open question. Great. Thank you. Uh, Eduardo, you can unmute I'm, yourself. I have to unmute myself. Uh, so I have two related questions. Uh, one is, as you said correctly, this approach. You're allowed one, Eduardo. We're out of time. <laughs> yes. Okay. I lost the less technical question. It's about gauge invariance. So the 
the description you give of both faces require that something condenses or something to that effect, which, as you said correctly, disorder parameters are in gauge environment. You do the exact uh, integration over the gauge fields, which presumably takes care of the problem, but then there is a question. No, 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 no. no let, let me be, okay. be more precise. What we do is the exact integration in computing the RG equations. I see. Once you get RG flow to strong coupling, well, so on this side, you, you know, you, you flow to strong coupling where this and this state becomes much lower than that. That's all we know. I and see. then we make a guess. Okay, well, if this is much lower, then you better condense it. That's all. <laughs> but it's not clear what condensing means in the, uh, to, to this gauge I agree. No, I agree. Okay. Absolutely. It does not, <laughs> this is just a language I'm using to, 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 to connect your intuition. But yes, you have to solve the whole thing exactly. But, I mean, it seems very reasonable that on this side, it should be just a Fermi liquid, and that's exactly what you get when you condense this side. You get exactly the right behavior. Yeah. You can reproduce, you can get this very simply from just condensing this. Yeah. And conversely, on this side, like condensing the Schunger bosons, you can get these two behaviors very simply. Yeah. I understand this is a very elegant solution of the problem, but I want to understand <laughs> what are the underpinnings, if you wish. The other is when you, yes. do larger, you do the subtle point approximations, usually you need a large spin. Um, and here, uh, okay, you know, there's, different, there, there's different large ends here. Yeah. So there's this N here, which is the number of sites. So of that course. is infinite. Yes. If you want to make that small, uh, then you no, no. the Schwarzschild theory, which, okay, okay. okay. See, okay. this is infinite. No, the Beyond that, is... no other, we, we don't take any other large end limit. That the only large end limit we take is n going to infinity for the RG analysis. That's it. And, and then you can do the subtle point with impunity. If you want. <laughs> well, if you take this large end limit, you get yeah. this pad integral. Yeah. This pad integral, uh, yeah. we solve to all orders in epsilon we, okay. with no further approximation. Okay. All right. So I'm there. Are a couple more questions have appeared, but I'm afraid we're out of time. So uh, you'll have to ask the questions uh, privately. I'm afraid. Let's uh, let's thank Zubir once.